Fun Adventure. Presented by the Mutual Broadcasting System with the University of Chicago for America's radio audience. These Friday evenings through science and scholarship enter with us upon a new search toward the fuller understanding of our universe, ourselves, and our society. Our host is Thomas Park of the Division of Biological Sciences of the University of Chicago. Our story is the story of man's search for knowledge, which is science, his search for wisdom, which is scholarship, the adventure in ideas, which is the human adventure. This day, the story of the birth, the nurture, and the establishment of one of the key ideas of the modern world. This hour, Charles Darwin and his thesis, Evolution by Natural Selection. The place is London. The day is the 24th day of November. The year is 1859. It is a leisurely London, this foggy day of November. Victoria is queen. The British Navy is mistress of the seas. London is the capital city. And as good Englishmen believe, the sun keeps a special watch over the far-flung British Empire and the orthodoxy of its ideas. Yet this day in London, a horse-drawn carriage makes its way along the old-fashioned pavement, its destination a modest bookstore. And in the carriage, a rather formidable old lady, her nephew, a student at the university, and a cat. Oh, be still, kitten, can't you? Now, 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 kitten. Kitten, Aunt Vicky. I say, Cesar's a full-grown thumb. He was a kitten long before I went up to varsity. Oh, and if he was, I still prefer to think of him as a kitten. I think of you as a schoolboy, for that matter. Oh, I dare say you do, Aunt Varsity or no varsity. Uh, this book by Mr. Darwin, if you're to buy at the booksellers, it has something to do with your studies, I take it? Well, I don't quite know, Auntie. I mean, specifically... It deals with geology, biology, natural history, and that sort of thing. Record of the rocks and of life and so on. <laughs> Record of the rocks, indeed. In my time, a young gentleman was soundly educated in Greek and Latin. He learned about life on the grand tour of Europe. Oh, but the rocks tell us how old the world is, aren't they? <laughs> when I was a girl, we knew exactly how old the world was. Bishop Usher proved it from the scriptures. The world, he proved, was created in the year 4004 B.C. on a Friday in October at 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> oh, seriously, Aunt Vicky. The world is much older than people in your day thought. Older, perhaps. The question would be better. How old is the world now? Millions of years old, Auntie. Why, this very street we're on was once covered by ocean. The rocks under London prove that. And there have been great changes in the world since its beginning. <laughs> Oh, there, there, kitten. Oh, some consolation to know that cats have always been here to console old maids like me. Some people used to think that cats have changed, too. Now, the Greeks... Want... The Greeks, my word. Oh, don't let that trouble you, Aunt Vicky. Everyone knows that animals don't change. The species remain exactly as created. Every kind, fixed and separate. Well, here we are at the booksellers, Auntie. I'll just pop in and out and we'll have our book by Mr. Darwin. Now, our host on the human adventure, Mr. Thomas Park of the Division of Biological Sciences of the University of Chicago. Tonight, our story traces the history of an idea, an idea at first considered radical, but now so fully accepted, understood, and significant that it forms part and parcel of our modern educational curriculum. Tonight also, we learn how this idea, through work and thought, germinated and developed in the mind of that great scientist, Charles Darwin. The concept of natural selection came to Darwin partly as a sudden flash of insight, but this dramatic moment was by no means the whole story. The idea had a long history of study and an extended period of testing before it was published. The theory of evolution has proved to be of monumental significance for biology and other fields of knowledge. There have been changes in the interpretation of the theory under the stress of that scientific criticism which never ceases. New discoveries have cast further light on the workings of natural selection, 
But Charles Darwin laid the cornerstone, a cornerstone in the adventure of scientific discovery and verification. On this 24th day of November in the year 1859, Charles Darwin's book goes on sale in London. The whole modest first edition of 1,250 copies is sold out on the day of issue. The evidence is marshaled. The conclusion stated, evolution is a fact. Descent with modification is the law of life. Instantly, overnight, the lines of conflict are drawn. The complacent orthodox world, which is Victorian England, erupts into a storm of controversy. This book is blasphemy. Right blasphemy. Are we to believe that all favorable varieties of turnips are tending to become men? <laughs> I've read a book or two, and to my mind there ain't a bit of evidence for his suggestion. The terror is merely a fact rubber with no nobility of understanding. Darwin denies our cherished beliefs to insist that we believe in a chain of bubbles. <laughs> A storm of abuse, a bitter, intemperate, all-too-human controversy. That is behind us now. Yet the birth of Darwin's idea begins long before the publication of the work called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. The story begins in the year 1831, aboard the HMS Beagle. Charles Darwin sets out on what he called his second life, the five-year adventure which was to lead him to his great life work. These are entries from young Darwin's diary. December 27th, 1831. Aboard the Beagle outside the breakwater, we scudded away from England at seven to eight knots. December 31st. Spent the day horizontally reading Lyell's Principles of Geology. Entirely new conception of formation of the Earth. Seasick. Still seasick. This day very nearly fated from exhaustion. January 10th, had made a four-foot canvas bag to drag behind vessel. Caught small mass of sea animals in it. Seasick. January 16th, it was good to feel land under my feet. I've seen the glory of tropical vegetation. Tamarinds, palms, bananas. Must collect jungle flora and fauna in Brazil. Our plans then are to visit the grasslands in Argentina and the high windy plains of Patagonia. In barren Patagonia, Darwin observes in company with a young midshipman. Look here, Stokes, in this red mud. Yeah, what is it? Fossil remains. Hmm. Bones are much like those of a sloth, but a giant one. If we could find the rest of the bones, you'd see that it's as large as an elephant. And these certainly are uh, like anything else in the world. No, as I said, it's more like the sloth, the uh, living South American animal. More like the armadillo than any old world form. Why should there be this similarity between the living and the extinct species of one region? Well, apparently this continent must have once swarmed with monsters. Larger animals, certainly. And what's most amazing is that there has been no great change in the form of the land since they lived. What could have caused their extermination? Uh, some great uh, catastrophe, perhaps? Mm, hardly. To extinguish the animals of an entire continent, why, we'd have to shake the framework of the globe. Thus comes the first inkling of some connection between the living and the extinct species. And now, many months later, passage around the Horn completed, Darwin and Stokes go ashore at the Galapagos. Oh, I say, Darwin, it's juiced hot on these islands. Dry, too. Lava soil. I've made a rather close acquaintance with the cactus. I've never seen such cactus thickets. <laughs> Only planted about as far as I can see. Well, most plants are leafless to conserve water stokes, a means of survival for them. Oh, birds survive handsomely. The funny thing, the birds on this island have no fear of men. Fly right up to you. Said I could catch him in his hat if he cared for them. Well, these island birds don't know our true nature, Stokes. They're not afraid because they've no natural enemies. Uh, wait a second. Something moving. Something big. I see it. Don't get too close. Oh. 
On my word, it's a tortoise. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Big fellow. It must weigh 300 pounds. Not afraid of it, sir. Oh. He sees us. He stops. <laughs> Oh, here's the way, old chap. You can't harm us at this distance. Looks like a primitive animal. Uh, something before the flood, you know. Yet beautifully specialized for life on these islands. Notice uh, this big fellow's on his way to water far inland. By going a long way for fresh water, he survives. Oh, I say. You scientific chaps are interested in the strangest thing. Tortoises differ from island to island, Stokes. The natives can tell which island each variety of tortoise comes from. Birds are all the same, though. No, they look the same at first glance. But on these islands, I've noticed variations in a single species of ground finch. Almost as if one species had been modified for different purposes. For five years, Charles Darwin observes, questions, speculates on all that he has seen. And he returns to England puzzled by ever-recurrent questions. Why are the animals in the southern part of South America different from those in the northern part? Why, with a similar climate, are the animals of South America so different from those in Africa? Why have the large animals disappeared from South America? If species are created separately, why were the flora in the life of the Galapagos similar to that of America? Similar, but not identical. It is now clear to Darwin that the current theory that each species is unchangeable and specially created does not explain the facts he has observed. He is haunted by the dim inkling of a new theory. Species must change. They must gradually become modified. Yet, how do they change? How did a tree frog, for instance, become adapted to a tree? How did a woodpecker develop its peculiar clinging claws and its drilling beak? These changes are facts. Perhaps if I had enough so the collection of facts begins. Darwin turns to English gardeners and animal breeders for examples of plant and animal variation. You ask why these plants are so hardy, Mr. Darwin? I'll tell you why. We select only the seed from the best plants to use the next season, and so on season after season, sir. Now you're talking about my favorite subject, Mr. Darwin. My sheep are the animals they are because I select them to be that way. I begin by picking out the best animals I have to breed and go on with selections, you might say, until this year's selection. 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 The first answer comes to Darwin. It is by selection that man has developed useful plants and animals. But how can this process, this process of selection, take place in nature? What factor in nature plays the part of man's conscious planned intelligence? This is the question. The answer comes unexpectedly. Fifteen months after Darwin begins his systematic inquiry into domestic selection, the young biologist reads from the works of Thomas Malthus' famous essay on population. And what Malthus writes, the number of living things in the forest which are killed off year by year by the ceaseless, silent, desperate struggle for the means of subsistence is uncountable. Millions of seeds never see light. Darwin muses an instant. The answer comes to him in a flash. In such a struggle, only the organisms best fitted for that struggle will survive. And this struggle acts as a selective process in nature. That's it. I have it. The natural selection of favorable chance variations through the struggle for existence. This is the law accounting for the changes in the Earth's inhabitants. This is the theory by which I can work. <laughs> Natural selection. Darwin has come upon the master key explaining the origin of species and the phenomena of adaptation. He undertakes a vast labor of inquiry, begins a gigantic correspondence with fellow scientists, breeders, observers, and the facts come to be marshaled in his notebooks. From New Zealand... The gigantic fossil birds found here show a marked resemblance to birds now living. From South America... The young wild lager-headed duck can fly while the adults can only flap along the surface of the water. From Audubon in America. I have often found a remarkable difference in the nests made by the same species of bird in the northern and southern parts of America. From India. The Katiwa horses 
are always striped on the spine, the shoulder, and sometimes the face. And from a breeder in England, another note on the horse's link with its wild relative. A weak old foal from a bay mare in a bay racehorse was marked in his hand quarters and on its forehead with numerous narrow zebra-like bars. All the stripes soon disappear. In 1839, Darwin marries Emma Wedgwood. They move to a house at Down, 20 miles from London. In spite of his illness, Darwin continues on a task which has become enormous. Emma Darwin reads to her husband. Charles, this is interesting. Hmm? In Massachusetts, a short-legged ram was born that could not jump over fences. The owners, seeing the advantage of this, began to breed for short legs, creating the ancorn species of sheep. This is to be expected, my dear. As we know, animals and plants vary. These individual differences are often inherited, thus creating the beginnings of new varieties, which in time become new species. When man interposes, the change is purposeful and recorded. But the fact, Charles, is from nature. One slow-breeding elephant, bringing forth six young during its lifetime, would have nearly 19 million descendants in 750 years. So it would, my dear. But the earth houses multitudes of species beside elephants. Thus the multiplication of any one species is checked by the struggle for life between organic beings. And everywhere, the being best adapted to its conditions of life, if only by a slight variation, is the most likely to survive and produce offspring which have in turn these advantages. Hmm. Here's something about wolves. In the Catskill Mountains in America, there are two kinds of wolves. One is slim and swift and pursues deer. The other is shorter and heavier and preys upon the flock. Exactly. Now, if the farmers ceased raising sheep, the heavy wolf, unable to compete with its uh, swifter brother for deer, would perish. Thus, by natural selection, uh, not of the largest or the strongest, but of the most fit to the conditions of life, new forms are gradually developed, and forms losing in the struggle become extinct. Thus far, a story of patient accumulation and painstaking research. Not until 1844, when the torment of illness makes it seem Darwin will not live to finish his work, does he permit himself to put in writing a brief sketch of his views. This sketch establishes a priority, confirms the beginning of the Darwinian idea, but it is not published. Fifteen more years of patient study round out the monumental preparation for the book which is to reframe forever the ideas of our world. The spirit of Darwinian research is recorded in the words of the scientist. I have made it a golden rule to write down all facts unfavorable to my hypothesis. These unfavorable facts, doubts, questions, loomed large before me. I set myself to ask questions and to answer them. Why do we not see missing links? Because the new, more perfect form takes the place of and exterminates the parent form. The evidence of earlier forms must be looked for in the graves of past epochs. How is it possible that natural selection can produce an organ as complex and perfect as the eagle's eye? By the accumulations over periods of thousands of years of countless slight variations of the simple pigment-coated optic nerve. How can life have been transported from its original source to all parts of the world. By wind and wave, by fish and birds carrying seeds and eggs, by glaciers driving northern life to the south, by geographical changes, the earth has been populated. <laughs> Are you busy right now? No. What is it, Emma? I've just noticed this bottle on the shelf. What is in it? What bottle? Oh, that. Uh, two little embryos in alcohol. Oh. What kind? One is a bird, the other a lizard. Which is which? I've forgotten. 
Oh, surely you can tell them apart, Charles. No, really, it's quite impossible. The formation of head, trunk, and extremities of animals at this early stage is almost identical. Why, I didn't dream. The feet of lizards and mammals, the wings and feet of birds, the hands and feet of man, all rise from the same fundamental form. In the stages of the embryo, we can see the panorama of evolution in miniature. I'm amazed. Oh, Charles, your subject is so vast. It takes in all of natural history. Hmm. And it gets bigger and bigger with each month's work. Sometimes it seems it will break me. If I could be of more help to you. It is you who make my work possible. You see, Emma, you and I are rich in a way. We are rich in facts. I think now that I may prove, prove utterly and without question, that the species are not fixed kinds of being. I'm almost certain now that, that the species change. The species change. <laughs> And then the warning from his good friend, Sir Charles Lyell, the geologist. You should publish, darling. Somebody else will come out with your theory before you do. I wouldn't wait any longer. What would you suggest? Simply that you put your conclusions in writing. Get the paper to the Royal Society. This is an immensely important idea. It must be put before the world as a result of your work. Write it down, man. It's not wise to hold it back any longer. Heeding Lyell's warning, Darwin begins to write out his thesis on an extensive scale. He has finished ten chapters of his Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection by June of 1858. And then, on June 18th... The postman has just left this, Charles. A bulky letter. From Ternate in the Molucca Island. Strange. I don't recall that I know any naturalists out there. Open it, Emma. Read me a bit of it. Oh, it's uh, from young Alfred Wallace. Oh, yes, Wallace. Did some work on the Amazon. He's been in the Malay archipelago for the last few years. Uh, collects insects, as I recall. Mm-hmm. Across the top, is written, if you think well of this, will you send it to Lyell for perusal? Oh, yes, yes, of course. The title is On the Law Which Has Regulated the Introduction of New Species. What? Every species has come into existence. Coincident in time and coincident in time and space with a pre-existing, closely allied species. Charles, it's your idea. Let me see the paper. Here. In February, during a severe attack of intermittent fever, I began to think of Malthus' essay on population. At that instant, it suddenly flashed upon me the idea of the survival of the city. Charles! Charles, it's your work, it's your thesis, it's your idea. It could seem so, Emma. Still, young Wallace is a scientist. These are his findings. I shall write to Lyell, as he asks. I shall tell him candidly that I have never seen a more striking coincidence. Even his terms stand as heads of my chapters. I should be glad to publish my views, but... I cannot persuade myself that I can now do so honorably. Sir Charles Lyell and Sir Joseph Hooker, both distinguished British scientists, act as arbitrators in this matter of scientific honor. Wallace's paper is read together with an abstract of Darwin's views as a joint report to the Linnean Society on July 1st, 1858. The layman may measure the generosity of Darwin, the true greatness of Wallace, when the latter says, My work was a work of inspiration. Compared to Mr. Darwin's work, mine stands as a contribution of a few weeks, in contrast with a contribution of 20 years. I could not possibly have written a report of such learning and magnitude. The storm, the controversy, the bitter battle of ideas following Darwin's publication of The Origin of the Species has long since been forgotten. Yet something of its sharpness and thunder needs to be noted here as a record and rebuke to the closed mind. That rebuke is administered to Bishop Wilberforce before an open meeting at the British Association for the Advancement of Science. The bishop concludes his address. I am proud to say that my ancestors have been true Britons. But of Mr. Huxley's ancestors, I cannot say. 
Perhaps he thinks otherwise. Mr. Huxley, is it through your grandfather or through your grandmother that you claim descent from a monkey? Thomas Henry Huxley, square-jawed, blunt-spoken in his own phrase, Darwin's bulldog, faces a hostile audience, measures the insult, measures his opponent. Neither Mr. Darwin nor myself has ever pretended that any living man has ape-like parents. The ape family and the human family may have diverged from a common stock long ago in the mists of time. But I am not ashamed of so humble an ancestry. If there is any ancestor of whom I should have cause to be ashamed, it is a man who uses great gifts and empty rhetoric not to advance, but to obscure the truth. This day, this year of 1946, no qualified scientist in the world, no specialist from a single one of the world's great universities denies the basic conception of evolution. Science has added much to Darwin's findings. Science has modified many details of variation and the method of variation. But the concept remains. The concept of evolution as the law of life abides in Darwin's view, takes on clarity and beauty from Darwin's own words. From the struggle of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, the production of the highest forms of being, follows. There is grandeur in this view of life, having been breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one, and that while this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved by the natural laws acting around us. The Human Adventure is jointly presented by the Mutual Broadcasting System and the University of Chicago. Selected programs are transcribed for rebroadcast for the overseas networks of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Music was by Kenneth Churchill, the conductor, Robert Trendler. The part of Charles Darwin was played by Herbert Butterfield. The script editor, in cooperation with the University of Chicago, Francis Coughlin. The writer, La Montaigne. The director, Morrison Wood. One week from tonight, The Human Adventure will present Tourists to America. Europeans report on the incredible USA. That's one week from tonight, Tourists to America. Europeans report on the incredible USA. Now a message brought to you at the request of your government. To hold the line against inflation is a joint post-war battle calling for the cooperation of business, government, and the people of the United States. To play your individual part, your government asks you to spend sensibly, making minimum demands upon goods and services already scarce, to pay no more than ceiling prices, thus holding the line on price control, and to keep and continue your investments in war, victory, and United States savings bonds. Mutual Broadcasting System.